What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyles here for CLNS Media, bringing you another episode of Pat's Daily, brought to you by our friends at FanDuel Sportsbooks. More from them later, but first, we're entering a very pivotal offseason. Already in a pivotal offseason for the Patriots. They're building out their staff. We've been covering that for a while, but the time is quickly approaching for them to start building out their roster. And more important, I would say quarterback is up there, but right under there, I think, for them is the offensive line, specifically tackles. So to get the best insight on the Patriots offensive line, I listen to the help of Brandon Thorne, friend of the channel. Brandon, thank you so much for coming on. You do amazing work. I was just telling you before the show about how heavily I lean on your work when it comes to scouting these guys. You do a great job at Bleacher Report with Trench Warfare. Sign up also if you aren't already. But uh, Brandon, how are you doing? And uh, give me your thoughts on the Super Bowl also from more of a trenches perspective, because this was a really big uh, defensive battle and it felt like a big one that was decided by the big boys down there. Yeah, well, thanks for having me again. Um, I always appreciate coming on. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, as far as the Super Bowl, you know, I, I definitely think there were a few standout things in terms of the trenches. And, you know, I think one of the more underrated ones, you know, now that they lost is just the 49ers front. You know, I just thought their defensive front was awesome in that game, specifically Nick Bosa. Um, you know, I, I think he was charted, you know, nine, 10 pressures or whatever. Um, so he was affecting the game um, pretty much you know, throughout, uh, but also Javon Hargrave had moments, uh, Eric Armstead, even Chase Young, you know, he had that that, ha- that high quality sack on, on Donovan Smith where, you know, hit him with the swipe and beat him clean. Um, he also had another couple of good rushes. So, I mean, I feel like 49ers front, you know, definitely did their part in that game. Um, and I, that was one of the bigger, bigger mismatches of the game going in, especially with Joe Tooney out of the game. Um, you know, and, and the Chiefs tackles not necessarily being, you know, much more than average, you know, ish. So that was to be expected, but they definitely like lived up, you know, to what people thought that they could do. Um, that was as good of they've, as they've played in weeks. Um, so that stood out for sure. And then, of course, Chris Jones, you know, was Chris Jones, um, you know, just more of the same there. Uh, he, he had a mismatch against everybody not named Trent Williams. So. Uh, he, he definitely took advantage in some key moments. Um, I think Mike Pennell, you know, just what he did against the run. There's that clip, you know, on Twitter of him, you know, stuffing Trent Williams um, on that block, which is impressive. But he's always just been kind of a stout, big, strong run defender, um, kind of a like an, a, like, uh, an assassin for hire kind of guy, like a two down guy that teams just bring in to stop the run, you know, and yeah. like, uh, Jonathan Hankins or, you know, somebody like that. He's, he's just one of those kind of guys. Um, so he definitely, I thought had a really strong game as well. So, yeah, I mean, aside from that, um, I thought Trent Williams was awesome as well. Um, just overall, he was just really good, impactful blocks in the run game. Um, yeah, I mean, other than that, Creed Humphrey would probably be the last guy, you know, that really stood out to me. I thought he had a great game as well. So, yep. so the guys with the big names are making some big plays in this game pretty much. Definitely. And especially you mentioned Mike Pinnell. He had a cup of tea with the Patriots. I remember I was really disappointed when they separated with him. I was like, I don't know. I know, you know, nose tackle isn't in vogue exactly, but this dude, he, he has a job and he does it very consistently. And we've seen that. Now he's got a couple of rings to show for it. So, you know, yeah. don't love the whole thing that happened with David Andrews when he was off the Patriots, but overall, you know, good for him. That was a long time ago. I think it's about time we all move on emotionally. <laughs> all right, now, moving on in the show. So for the Patriots, new offensive coordinator Alex Van Pelt comes from that Kevin Stefanski offense where they ask a lot of their offensive linemen when it comes to pulling and really being athletic. And this is a Patriots offensive line where Trent Brown and Mike and Wendell were going to be free agents. And you're kind of assuming that you got – David Andrews, City So, and then Cole Strange inside. But even they've got some question marks. So before we kind of get into the more position specifics, what do you think about this Alex Van Pelt scheme kind of from a Kevin Stefanski perspective and what they might be asking uh, of the Patriots in the trenches this season? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be multiple more than anything. Just that's kind of Kevin Stefanski's background. He's been on different coaching staffs over the course of his career and has kind of adopted a lot of different schemes over the, over that period of time. Um, and, you know, when you watch the Browns over the last few years, I know Callahan kind of directs, you know, that run game. Um, so it's kind of hard to distinguish that sometimes, you know, when the offensive line coach is designing the run game compared to the head coach, of course, it's all collaborative, but um, you know, as with most schemes in the NFL, I think it's, 
going to have a lot of different elements of zone and gap. Um, I, if I had to pick one, it'd probably be a little bit more zone based um, more than anything, you know, inside, outside zone, pin pull will probably be in there, you know, things like that. And then, uh, you know, every team is going to have some power counter, um, you know, maybe throw in some traps, you know, just some off, off, off ball kind of stuff uh, or, you know, oddball kind of stuff just to throw, you know, curve balls out there for defenses to have to prepare for. But yeah, I would say zone based and then, you know, multiple is kind of the overarching theme in the run game. Um, that's, that's probably what I would expect to see. Yeah. And I know their scheme is, you know, a lot of wide zone. I know I heard Alex Van Pelt say that was kind of the backbone of what they like to do, but yeah. was surprised to see that only the Ravens run more gap schemes with pullers. So again, ask a lot of their guys in that perspective. I also saw that you tweeted about Scott Peters, their new offensive yeah. line coach, obviously learned under Callahan. I was yeah. wondering if you could get some insight on him because he's a guy that not a lot of people know about, but has a very interesting background. Yeah. So MMA background, you know, he's, you know, I think he won like a world championship or something in, in Jiu Jitsu. And uh, he also was a part of an organization called uh, Tip of the Spear, I believe. Um, when I was writing for USA Football years ago, uh, they had an affiliation with that. And I, I got to get access to a lot of like those uh, coaching clinics that um, Coach Peters, you know, put together at the time. And his emphasis was, you know, keeping your head out of the block and, you um, yeah, uh, utilizing you know your length, playing long, um, a, a lot of these kind of coaching cues that a lot of people have adopted over the years, um, and it's kind of permeated its way throughout the NFL. I know one of his pupils uh, back in the day was Brandon Scherf, you know the the Commanders, Redskins, now you know Jaguars offensive lineman. He he would probably speak very highly of Coach Peters because he adopted a lot of those principles into his game. Um, there's a couple other guys, but he was the biggest name guy. I remember that coach Peters had an impact on, uh, with that approach. Um, but yeah, he really understands angles, leverage, uh, really well. Um, and he knows how to convey that to people, uh, at a high level. Um, so it, it's cool that he, you know, can merge, you know, MMA and, uh, that into the offensive line world in the way that he does. I spoke with him for a story years ago on, on Wyatt Teller. Uh, who he had a big impact on, you know, developing with the Browns. Um, so, I mean, he's he's been a part of obviously a, a coaching staff with maybe the greatest offensive line coach of all time outside of Skarnakia, you know. Um, uh, you know, like those two are probably two of the best ever, and Peters has come up under him, um, and he's had his fingerprints on a lot of really good players and their developments. So, I mean, I'd be excited if I was a Patriots fan, honestly, to, to get him. And I know it's his first time having a room, but, you know, being the head guy. But, I mean, you know, I think if you're going to hire an assistant and it be the first time guy, he's as excited as I'd be about anybody, probably. Yeah. I mean, watching videos of him, I'm like, this seems like a guy who can command a room. I don't think there's going to be any question about no, that. But, yeah, obviously, yeah. we'll see once you know, he actually involved. gets going. Yeah. Right, exactly. You yeah. have the actual hands-on experience. Get your buckets with your first bet at FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers will $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 if your bet wins. Bet on all your favorite NBA players and teams. Quick bets, live same-game parlays, exclusive props, and more. Just visit FanDuel.com slash Boston and shoot your shot. FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right. So with these positions, the first thing I want to talk about is tackle. Because the Patriots, both their bookends from last season, are about to hit the market, at least as far as we know now. So Trent Brown obviously started off really well, was a PFF darling last season. Then he got rolled up on against Buffalo and just had to deal with a bunch of injuries for the rest of the season. Mike and Wenu switched over, I think it was around week seven. It was in that same Bills game. Had a lot of success at right tackle as he's had throughout his career, although I think he's more of a guard. Um, kind of interesting how it's going to fit in this scheme, but how do you think the Patriots should address the offensive tackle position? Do you think they'd be better off re-signing both guys and maintaining some continuity there? Or do you think maybe they should move on when you do a different position, move on from Trent Brown? What are kind of your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, this this one's tough. It's You know, I, I kind of lean towards at least keeping one of them just because it's so hard to find tackle. Uh, you know, almost every team in the league is is 
you know, always kind of looking, surveying the tackle market, whether free agency or the draft. Typically, you're not going to find a really good tackle in free agency. And if you're going to find one in the draft, it's going to be in the first round. Um, you know, of course, there's exceptions and, you know, there's ways to, you know, kind of patch it together, um, especially if you have a really good offensive line coach. And if your scheme is offensive line friendly, you know, a lot of RPOs play action, uh, you know, kind of a run first approach, you know, that kind of thing that can help mitigate and hide, you know, your lack of talent at the position. Um, so, you know, all that being said, I, I mean, I would just say, you know, go with the younger guy and Mike and Wanu and, uh, you know, give you some flexibility as well, um, you know, to play inside and out, um, which Trent Brown doesn't really bring there, um, although he does bring flexibility on the side, but uh, in terms of what side he can play. But yeah, I mean, I would probably just lean on Wano. It's going to be more expensive probably as well. So that's, you know, double-edged sword, almost every angle you take here. Um, but uh, but yeah, that's probably where I would go and then just try to address um, the opposite tackle uh, position in the draft, um, which I think that they're well positioned to do um, whether, you know, I don't know if they would take one where they are now in the draft or if they trade down or, or, or trade back up or, you know, anything like that. But this, this class has a lot of tackle options that'll probably trickle into, you know, round two as well. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think this is a good class to need a tackle. But we're going to get into more of their kind of off season options and things like that. Before we do I want to touch on the interior as well. Because it's a spot where on paper they've got bodies. Like they've got City So, who I thought looked really good, especially considering they tried to start him out at tackle before they were like, all right, no, he's really a guard. Uh, Cole Strange really started to look better before he had a second knee injury, which is a big thing here where you really don't even know what his availability is going to be like. You've got Antonio Mafi behind them. You've got Jake Andrews, who showed that he could play a little bit of guard later in the season. But do you think the Patriots should still address the spot? Like, I would love to know what you thought about City's first season. And also, if, you know, Cole Strange maybe has some a significant time, if that's somewhere you think they should either go outside and bring someone in, you know, considering this new scheme, or if you think Jake Andrews and Antonio Maffi, with the help of someone like a Scott Peters, could maybe be able to fill that void. Yeah, I mean, this is another, <clears throat> if we're looking at it, at it collectively as like a trio, I mean, I definitely think that you would want to bring at least one guy in here, specifically a guard you know, assuming, you know, the Andrews, you know, David and Jake, um, you know, could kind of handle that and, you know, maybe, you know, offer some, some guard there with Jake, uh, potentially, I don't know, but, um, yeah, I mean, just because, you know, throwing the injury in there with Cole Strange, that definitely throws a wrench into things. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I have no insight on that, but, um, if he is going to miss time, you definitely want to have another option outside of Mafi to, to play guard, especially in this system, if you are going to be running a lot of wide zone and, you know, asking your guys to, to move, you know, laterally and, you know, get on the move, you know, you know, quite a bit, I just think you would want another guy in there. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would be shocked if they don't address, um, you know, the offensive line multiple times this off season, um, you know, assuming say they just re-sign one of those tackles, like we said, I would expect a tackle and a guard, to be added, you know, in the first couple rounds and or via, you know, free agency. Uh, so, yeah, I would assume that that would be the case, um, especially having a new offensive line coach. I'm sure, you know, I don't know how he feels about any of these guys, but I'm sure he would want to kind of select, you know, or have a, a say in, in getting somebody, even if it is a depth piece that maybe he can get his hands on and develop. Uh, you know, something like that. So I would, ass I would assume they're going to give him, you know, some, some say there. And uh, if he isn't totally sold on all these guys, then, you know, giving him somebody to kind of work with, you know, on his own. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would expect, you know, definitely a guard and a tackle to, to be added, you know, with a fairly high compensation and or draft pick, you know, to this, to this team. Absolutely agree. And kind of bringing Mike and Winu back into the conversation, just from watching the Browns, it seems like their tackles don't really pull all that much. It's really more the center and the guard who has to get out there. So with that in mind, I kind of came into it before Van Pelt was hired really and thought, all right, and Winu, you want to bring him back. He's probably best as a guard. Do you think in this kind of scheme, though, he might be better suited at tackle where he might not be asked to move in space and pull as often? I think he could stay at tackle and, and play – you know, sort of a similar role as like a Jack Conklin, you know, did, mm -hmm. um, who, 
you know, stronger run blocker than pass blocker, bigger guy, stronger, powerful, you know, it's, you know, as you get more nuanced, they're definitely different players, but just kind of generally speaking, you know, they can fill, I guess, kind of a similar role. Um, so yeah, I, I think he could definitely stay a tackle in this scheme and, you know, be a, a good player like he has been. Just needed some Brandon Thorne validation. That's all. Thank you very much for that. All right. Now, moving on to free agency before we get to the draft. Who in this class do you think would be somebody that could potentially fit in this new Patriots system? Some guys I was thinking of that are more on the reasonable side were like a Jonah Williams or a James Illuminor maybe. And guards I'm still kind of looking into. I'm not sure who would fit because, you know, with Cole Strange, it's like, all right, you want somebody who could probably step in and play for you, but maybe not somebody who's coming in and saying, I am the starter. So, you know, the guys I mentioned, if there's anybody else who comes to mind, who do you think could potentially be a good fit for New England? Yeah, I think Jonah Williams would make sense if you don't bring back on Wanu, um, assuming he's going to be cheaper, which I think he you know, probably will be. Uh, that would be the only reason I would think that you would really want to swap them out um, is just cost. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, Jonah Williams definitely would, would make sense as, you know, a solid, you know, option at tackle. Um, would you, you know, say, at, I'm sorry, would you say right exclusively, or do you think he can still go back to the left? Cause I, I'm not um, sure if he wants to go back for sure or not, but yeah, I mean, I guess he could go back to the left. Um, I, I don't know. I kind of liked his tape last year, at right tackle. And especially as he settled in, I thought he settled in pretty nicely. And, you know, that seems like, I, I would assume teams would probably feel similarly to that in terms of like comparing at least, you know, last year at left tackle wasn't very good. The year before that was pretty good at left tackle. So it's a little bit up and down. Um, yeah, but I mean, I guess that one, you know, he could play left. So yeah, maybe on Wanu and Jonah Williams at left, you know, that, that wouldn't be too much of a surprise there. So that's in terms of tackle free agents though, like, you know, every year it's bare. I mean, there, there's, there's really not like uh, just looking at the list right now. I mean, there's guys that, you know, flashed and, you know, whatnot, like George Fant, you know, um, from the Texans last year, filled in admirably there, uh, had a had a pretty good year. Like he's a kind of a stopgap option, you know, that, that would be one. Um, I mean, I, I'm going down the list here. It's, you Stop. mentioned the <laughs> Luminor from the Raiders. I mean, I think he's okay, you know, as a starter. I mean, definitely stop cap at best. Yeah, um, yeah it's just it's tough to, to find the tackles. I think I – I mean, ideally you would go tackle in the draft, you know, especially if you're drafting a guy that you need to be a starter right away. Um, and then you could find the interior guys later in the draft or in free agency, and it's just a little bit easier to find those guys just because the supply is higher. You know, definitely, definitely. All right. So let's move on to the draft then, because it seems like this is one that's honestly, it feels like you could find someone to fit uh, right and left throughout the draft, but it feels like this is more right tackle heavy. So maybe we'll go on both sides of the line. We'll start off with which left tackle options do you think would be good fits, whether it is, you know, like a Joe Alter and Olu early on, or if they decide to wait to like the second or maybe even later in the draft for like a Javon Foster, someone maybe, maybe want to develop behind if they do sign like a Jonah Williams. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think any any of these tackles w would make sense. Um, you know, honestly, I, I don't see any of these guys that would not be fits in this scheme for any reason. So I think the obvious one, you know, is, is Joe Walt, just because even though Belichick, you know, isn't there anymore, but like Joe Walt just, you know, when you watch him, the initial – person that you think of is, is Nate Solder, you know, just because of his height, his weight, his length, the way he moves. I, I think he is better than Nate Solder coming out of Colorado, but very similar body type. Um, so I could see kind of, you know, some appeal there, some connection there, uh, you know, and I think he would make a ton of sense, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, but you're going to have to pay a premium to get him. Um, same with Rashawn, it was same kind of deal. I mean, you're going to have to draft both those guys in the top 10. So, uh, but yeah, both those guys would make a lot of sense, you know, at left. Um, so, and then you mentioned like right tackles. There's a lot of right tackles in this draft. Uh, you know, JC Latham, Amarius Mims, Tyler Guyton, um, Kingsley Sua Matia from BYU played left and right. So he's one of the few guys that's played both. Um, you know, and I mean, really any of those guys. I don't know if there's a specific guy you wanted to talk about, but 
I don't see why any of those guys uh, wouldn't make sense in New England or, or really anywhere. I mean, this like the scheme thing, I, I think can get a little overrated. I mean, you know, it, it's just because so many teams are running multiple schemes right now, you know, in terms of the run game, there's very few like zone heavy schemes that don't do any, you know, gap concepts or vice versa. So these guys pretty much have to be able to do a little bit of everything. And I think all these guys kind of fit that. Um, I think the real distinction is pass protection. And, and even that a lot of teams are running, you know, at least some RPOs or play actions. So there's not a ton of true drop back passes. That's also going to depend on your quarterback. Um, you guys with Mac Jones, you know, he has a lot of experience running RPOs, um, you know, going back to Alabama. So assuming that they're going to fold those in somehow, you know, you don't necessarily need to rely on your tackles heavily in the true drop back pass game. Um, and that is helpful for all these rookies, you know, and uh, there, there's not a lot of rookies that are going to come in and be able to really execute a true drop back pass game at a high level. I would say in this class, the only two I'd feel really comfortable doing that would be Joe Wall and Ola Fashano. But of course, those guys are going to be top 10 picks. So, um, yeah, um, as far as later round guys go, though, uh, you mentioned one. I like Javon Foster as well. Um, nice. I kind of have like a fifth, you know, fourth, fifth round grade on him. He might go higher because he had a pretty good senior bowl. I think he's probably going to test pretty well as well. You know, long arms. He, he fits the bill in terms of physical traits. Uh, you know, definitely a good developmental guy. Um, another guy, I mean, Roger Rosengarten is kind of interesting yeah. uh, from Washington. Um, I thought he should have stayed, honestly, but He's big. He's athletic, not super long, um, kind of like a, you know, Jonah Williams body type um, in, in, in some ways, uh, but definitely like twitchy, explosive, um, does a lot of fun things and pass protection. He's a guy I would love to develop. Definitely not, you know, start uh, anytime soon, but definitely a developmental piece. So those two guys, uh, Blake Fisher would be another one from Notre Dame okay. uh, opposite Joe Walt, their right tackle. He's another guy who would make a lot of sense, you know, somewhere, you know, late day two, early day three, you know, that you could develop as well. Good year to have major holes on the offensive line, especially on the edges. I want to get your thoughts on two more guys, though. Now, one is Patrick Paul, who I know had a lot of hype coming in in the senior bowl. I thought did some good things, but I know he uses that, like, hug technique a lot where you kind of just invite the bull rush, and it felt like he was still getting pushed back. Like, obviously, the technique, it's expected. But I felt like it happened more than you might like. So I was curious what your thoughts were on him. And also, I believe it was Travis Glover from Georgia State who came in because of an injury and I thought had one of the more impressive performances performances especially for somebody who came in late and I know you were actually boots on the ground so what were your thoughts on those two guys Patrick Paul and then Travis Glover yeah I mean Paul you know looked pretty much just like how he does on tape you know it's a little up and down um you know his he has crazy long arms crazy wingspan which is kind of a double-edged sword in and of itself and in terms of you know it's if you're not a little early with your hands it's real easy to be late when you're that long um, you know, and guys are able to kind of get past that initial strike and he winds up wide or high on a lot of guys with his hand placement. Um, and that just happens on tape. It happened in the senior bowl. And then that results in guys getting into his frame, into his chest, you know, pressing him open, walking him back, things like that. But you do see when he lands his hands on guys, he is very strong. Um, you know, he's a strong player. He reminds me a lot of Braxton Jones. Uh, you know, the Bears left tackle right now um, out of Southern Utah a couple of years ago. Very similar body type, very similar player. Um, they're both strong, um, you know, big guys with long arms, uh, you know, that need technique work. I, I do like Paul more than Jones, though. I think he's more athletic. Um, but, yeah, he that's going to need to get cleaned up to become a consistent starter in the NFL, I think. Uh, but, you know, he's probably – I think he's – what is he, my – seventh tackle uh right now seven yeah seventh overall tackle and you know I, I think ideally you get him you know round two you know somewhere um maybe round three that would be great i think that'd be great value for him we'll see where he goes how he tests all that but yeah i mean i think the senior bowl kind of you know just kind of confirmed what you saw on tape uh you know with him more than anything glover is a guy i did not watch you know coming into the week but 
yeah, anytime a guy comes in midweek, you know, kind of, you know, against the eight ball a little bit there, you know, just having to learn things on the fly and, and everything. And, you know, I thought he did, he did pretty well. I mean, you know, one-on-ones, you know, were, you know, up and down. I mean, the, I thought the thing that stood out to me was some of the patience that he was using. You know, he didn't look, you know, like he was scrambling out there. He looked confident, you know, he looked like, uh, you, you know, the moment wasn't too big for him or anything like that. And you could see that in some of his past sets in terms of how he was being patient, getting to a spot, not trying to, you know, chase guys and get manipulated out of position. So some of that was nice, but, you know, he did miss, you know, sometimes and, you know, get be, be clean, um, you know, a few times. It, it wasn't, you know, I mean, for, for the circumstances, I think it was, it was pretty good, you know, and it definitely is going to drive a lot of people to go watch his tape, me included. So I'll make sure, you know, I'll get a scouting report on him at some point. But, yeah, it, you know, all things considered, a, you know, pretty impressive performance from him. Well, this was amazing and informative as always, Brandon. Thank you so much for joining us. Before I get you out of here, please let the people know where they can find you and what work we should be looking out for. Yeah, so trenchwarfare.substack.com. Uh, people can go there. I just uh, did a film room with Joe Alt uh, that came out um, yesterday. I think I posted that. So yeah, sat down with an hour for you know, for an hour with Joe Alt and, and just broke down his film, and then have another one coming out shortly with uh, Jackson Powers Johnson. Uh, I'm going to be sitting down for about an hour with him, and you know I got a lot of guys coming out. So if people are interested in in these guys and you know kind of want to get a peek inside, you know their mindset or whatnot, I have those film rooms coming out, and then all my scouting reports will be on Bleacher Report. They're up now, and you know I'm I'm going to be writing more as we go along. So. Those are probably the two best spots. Awesome. And I'm literally going to check out that Joe Alt video as soon as we're done with this. So thank awesome. you for letting me know. All awesome. right. Thank you again, brother. Appreciate you so much. Appreciate you all for watching. As always, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And we'll see you next time. Peace, y'all.